Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and I want to dedicate this video to the memory of beloved IFS teacher Derek Scott, who passed earlier this week. Um, it was quite a shock to my own system. I went through a lot of st stages of grief and actually called upon him as an ancestor to help me with my own grief over the loss of him. And what's fascinating is that Derek Scott was one of the main teachers for me on the process of grief from an IFS lens. And so today I actually want to read a passage from Derek Scott's chapter on IFS and grief in this wonderful book, Innovations and Elaborations in Internal Family Systems Therapy. It's edited by Martha Sweezy and Ellen Ziskind, and it's got many wonderful entries, chapters on all kinds of topics um, and how IFS would approach them. So this chapter was written by Derek Scott, and I'm just going to share a little excerpt from you that I think is really, really powerful. Derek talks about <clears throat> there being kind of two types of grief, what he calls simple grief and complex grief. And um, sometimes I'll call it clean grief and dirty grief. Um, but what he means is that in simple grief, uh, there's always going to be these uh, layers of parts that come online that feel deep sadness, anger, um, you know, denial, all of those things in the grief process. And he calls them the grief cluster. And in straightforward, simple grief, we, we will go through that. In complex grief, um, there can be all kinds of reasons why we'll have complex grief. For example, he says on page 95, uh, chronic or delayed onset grief affects roughly 15% 15 per, 15 of mourners is more likely to occur under certain circumstances. For example, if the individual has experienced significant loss early in life that remains unresolved and or the loss relationship was a dependent one, like a caregiver. Also, if the person had an ambivalent or complex relationship with the deceased, relational factors like a lack of social support or a client's attachment style can also complicate grief. So Derek talks about how there's this natural oscillation in grief between this natural grief cluster and what he calls the restoration cluster, I believe is what he calls it. Yes, the restoration cluster is the, the group of parts that says, okay, we're going to designate a time for grief, but then we're going to come in and we're going to help you function in your everyday life. You've got to take care of yourself and your health and maybe go to work, take care of your dependents, those kinds of things. So there's this natural oscillation between the grieving parts and the those um, restoration parts, what he calls. So one of the things that might happen when there's complex grief is that that natural os oscillation does not occur and someone either gets completely stuck in the grief parts or gets completely stuck in the restoration parts and doesn't allow um, the grieving parts to be there. So it's, you know, one set of kind of this polarization takes over and exiles the other. So I want to read you this example that he gives. <clears throat> Derek says, as therapists, we can attend to and support the natural oscillations between the grief and the restoration clusters. But when there are no oscillations, we want to know why. Again, there's just curiosity around it. For example, we may notice <clears throat> that a client is mired in the loss cluster or conversely is only looking ahead. If the latter, only looking ahead, the person is stuck in the agenda of the restoration cluster and rarely seeks bereavement counseling or therapy until serious consequences build up. 
So sometimes people's restoration cluster takes over, you know, and it's like they're not even allowing their system to have awareness of their deep grief. Those parts are exiled. So they're just functioning and going about um, their business. The restoration cluster will likely have a lot of managers. Um, it may have some firefighters in it as well, but just keep going on, whatever you have to do to keep going on with life. So he gives the example of Fran. Derek says, after Fran's adult son, Mark, died of AIDS, Fran came to therapy because in reaction to their loss, her husband was spending all his time building a garage. On those rare occasions when Peter spoke of his son's death, he would say things like, one door closes, another opens. We have to get on with our lives. Um, some of those platitudes can be evidence of some of these parts that are, um, some people will call them you know, spiritual bypassers or they, they're trying they have good intention, right? They're trying to get us to move on, to be okay, but they're they're bypassing other parts. So Peter's relentless focus on restoration made Fran feel that she had lost her partner as well as her son. Yeah, I could see that. Yet at the same time, Fran was telling everyone that Mark had died of leukemia. As a result, she felt cut off from her family, friends, and her son, as well as her husband. I just want to make a note there. Yeah, when we can't be authentic, we can't be honest, you know, about uh, just the reality as it is or the reality of our emotions, we often feel very alone, very cut off. You know, we can even be around people, but if they don't know the truth of, of what's happening for us, it can feel very, very lonely. So as a result, she felt cut off from, from everyone. And along with her shame, this self-imposed isolation caused Fran's restoration cluster to step in vigorously, causing her to believe that she too should be moving on. So it could have been possible that because her husband's restoration cluster was in charge and was, you know, so dominant on this side, her grieving cluster might have become dominant to um, try to balance out her husband, right? A, a polarization is a burden system's way of trying to achieve balance, but a couple is also a system. And often when one person is blended with very extreme parts, another person will be blended with equal and opposite extreme parts to try to achieve balance. But in this case, I think because she felt isolated, it felt like in her system for her to survive, she also had to be blended with this um, restoration cluster. Just want to point out that there are other possibilities that could have happened. So she came in and she said, I just don't know what's wrong with me, Derek. It's been over a year and I keep trying to get on with my life, but I feel, I don't know, lonely, I guess. And I can't stop thinking about Mark. I know I should be over this by now. Sometimes I have nightmares in which he's dying and the life is literally being sucked out of him by a huge machine-like thing and his eyes are staring at me pleading and I wake up with sweats. Fran was wringing her hands and shifting uncomfortably in her seat. The other day I was shopping, she said, and I saw some candy that Mark liked when he was little and I just lost it. I broke down and I had to leave the store. I left my basket in the middle of the aisle. And now I can't go back there. I think maybe something's wrong with me. Do you? She looked at me anxiously. And Derek said, you're grieving, Fran. And you're trying to deal with this all alone. So some parts are eager to put it behind you. But other parts are missing Mark and they want attention. So Derek is really encouraging her that she's normal and that these clusters of parts, both the grieving parts and the restoration parts have good intention and it's normal for them to kind of oscillate back and forth. Fran nodded. Um, and then Derek went on. I think 
It would be most helpful to get to know the parts who are trying to get your attention through dreams or what happened in the store. Would that be okay? So often when parts are essentially exiled, so in this case, her grieving parts, they come up in the only ways in which they can, which is often in dreams, or they'll come up very suddenly and fiercely and strongly, um, almost bursting out, right? Because they're not being given regular attention. So he's asking, is it okay to, to turn toward them, to give them attention? And Fran says, um, I'm hearing that I shouldn't need to do that. I should be strong. So that sounds definitely like the restoration team, right? Which is saying, just look forward, just move on with your life. I've heard this from so many people who have lost really important people in their, in their life, their mother, their father, their spouse, their child. And sometimes they'll even be six months in and they'll say, I should be over this. I should feel better. And I think, why? <laughs> Who's telling you that, right? But they have people, sometimes they do have people outside of them who are trying to get them, their own restoration parts are trying to feel uncomfortable with their grief or trying to get them to move past it. And then they have internal, those internalized parts that say, you should be over this, you should be strong. Um, you know, this is uncomfortable for other people. You're being a burden, those kinds of things. And again, they mean well, because they want the person to survive socially. Um, but um, what they don't realize is that not giving enough room and breathing space for the grief, it actually will come out in inopportune times, right? It'll burst forward and, um, you know, in many ways cannot be contained. And that the best solution in my own experience is to turn toward the grief, have regular times where you know, maybe it's for 10 minutes. Early on, I've, I've found early on in grief, I need to designate a lot more time. And then as time goes by, maybe a little, little bit less. It's like reverse labor pains, right? The pain is so intense and so close together, close to a loss. Um, and as time goes, it might get a little further apart, but it's still important to me with any loss, no matter how many, how long ago it was, to designate time every day to be with the grieving parts, to give them voice, to give them loving attention, right? Even if it's just for a couple minutes to put our hand on our heart and say, how are you doing? I'm here with you. And the one who gives them permission to be there, to get bigger is bigger still. And that is our loving self. So I think Derek's kind of trying to propose this experiment. What if you did this? Um, so she notices that the restoration cluster is saying, you know, I don't need to do that. I should be strong. And Derek says, do the ones who want you to be strong have a specific concern? Fran listened inside and then said, their concern is that if we open up to that pain, I'm going to be humiliated again, like when shopping. They're also talking about how ashamed I felt when people found out that Mark was gay. So Derek says, I get what they're saying, and I'm glad they spoke up. But I, I also have a concern. Would they be willing to hear it? Fran nodded. Derek said, in my experience, not paying attention to a part makes it work harder and harder to be heard. Yes, this is definitely my experience too. Like the one who took you over when you were shopping or the one who interrupts your social time or disturbs your sleep. But I know from experience that after you spend time with a part who's upset, it will let you listen to the other parts too. So let's invite your parts to choose who needs your attention first. Fran listened inside for a moment and said, it's the one who feels ashamed. Beautiful exchange here. Just deep respect for all the parts. I love how Derek invited these parts to express their concern. And then he asked permission, can I express my own concern? And really, um, a lot of times parts are, protective parts are afraid of 
any part that holds intense emotion, whether it's grief or panic or rage, that if you go toward it, it's going to take over. What they don't realize, though, is that actually their job of exiling it, suppressing it, is what makes it push, push, push for further, because all any part ever wants is to be seen and heard and valued, right? So these parts are pushing, pushing until they burst out, right? Like what happened in during her shopping. Um, but when we allow, I, I liken it to a pressure cooker. It's like all of that grief is just staying in there. It's this, what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body, right? It's just, it's so condensed and um, pressurized, right? And so it bursts out, it explodes in inopportune times. Um, I would say anytime it comes out, we can turn toward it with loving attention, though I understand the concern of the parts. Like if we're in the grocery store, that's embarrassing. I would have panic that my parts were afraid of, and it would often come out in the grocery store. And I would tell them if, if it comes out, we can go to the bathroom, we can go to the car and just sit and turn toward it and tend to it. And my system learned that turning toward it actually was the best thing to do, but they had to gain experience with that, right? They had to, I had to offer them ex experiments. What if I turn toward it uh, for 10 seconds and just see what happens, right? In the middle of the grocery store, I would stop with the cart and I would put my hands on my heart, take a breath and say, I see you, I see you're here right now. I'm with you, I'm with you, you're not alone. And it would relax. Um, and I remember proposing the experiment, and I've done this with grief as well, um, proposing the experiment, you know, let, what if I am with it for 90 seconds, because that's the amount of time it takes for an emotional wave to rise and fall physically in our bodies and see what happens. And what if I tell the emotion it has permission even to get bigger? Um, and often I would do this in what felt like a safe space. Usually it was in my closet or in the bathroom or maybe curled up in a ball on my bed. And the protective parts at first were like, oh my gosh, that sounds terrifying. Like they literally thought I would physically die from the, the weight of the grief. And so I said, you know, you can come in and stop me if you need to, um, you have permission to do that, but can we just see what happens? And so I remember the first time, this was after my first husband's death, I allowed the wave of grief to come and I actually set a timer for 90 seconds and it did, it crescendoed and felt like I was going to die and then released through tears, released those stress hormones. And then there was a moment of, of peace and my protective parts saw how effective that was that just allowing the pressure cooker to be released just for a little bit not very long 90 seconds and and the, and for that pressure that's being released to be met with a compassionate loving tender witness right that can hold it and be with it was so powerful it was the most healing thing that my system had ever experienced. So those protective parts gradually allowed me to do it more and more. And so in that kind of intentional way of turning toward the grief and getting permission from the protectors to do so, the grief didn't feel like it had to push its way out, um, you know, in the grocery store or um, at other times. And I would always tell, you know, if it does, it's okay. We can go to the bathroom. We can go somewhere private and, and give it loving attention. Or sometimes, yeah, in the store, just right in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> um, okay. There's one more note here that Derek gives that I want to read. Um, he says, Kaufman coined the term disenfranchised grief to refer to losses that are disavowed or not socially supported and observe that such losses can intensify emotional reactions across the board. He suggested that self-disenfranchisement, 
which in IFS, we would call kind of our shaming protectors, right? So we can have people outside of us that shame us and say that grief is not sanctioned or, um, you know, legitimate in some way, but then we can also internalize, we can have parts inside that are telling us that our grief is not legitimate. Like I was saying, when Fran or many people who I know say, oh, I should be over this, right? Uh, it's not okay for me to grieve. There are parts that, that try to shut it down. Um, and it's, this is more likely with certain kinds of losses. For example, miscarriage, uh, the death of a pet, separation from a par partner who had perpetrating parts. That happened with my first husband because um, he was quite violent and abusive when I was married to him. And so even the separation, I had such intense, parts that had held such intense grief. And then after he died, parts that held such intense grief, but it felt really hard to talk to it about with people. The people would say things like, you must feel so relieved that he died, you know? And to be honest, there were parts that felt that, but then there were also parts that held intense grief. This was a person that I was with every day from, you know, 13 years of my life. And in many ways that I took care of my first husband, it helped me to look back on it like this. It felt like kind of like a rebellious teenage child of mine. It would be like I had a rebellious teenage child who died by suicide, right? And there were all kinds of parts of me who blamed me, who held guilt and intense grief over it. Uh, so it's very complex, right? It's hard to feel but for the guilt or I'm sorry, the guilt, the grief to feel legitimized. Um, so in Fran's case, her grief was being disavowed by parts of her who feared that she would be rejected by her stoic husband and shamed socially because of her son's sexual orientation and his illness. So she couldn't fully grieve the truth in front of others because of these parts who felt ashamed so it was wonderful that her system told her those are the parts that need attention first. In the language of IFS, Fran's protectors were trying to save her from being hurt and shamed while her distressed grieving parts were getting louder in order to get her attention and were at times overwhelming her. In response, her restoration cluster was urging her to move on. It's like as one gets bigger, the other gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and they just keep getting bigger until the self can really turn toward them. So as we continued with Fran's therapy, she gradually got more and more access to self energy and was able to help her fearful, socially conforming parts relax and to reassure her restoration cluster that grieving Mark's death would help her system stabilize so that she could truly move on. Yeah, sometimes it's it's like this hypothetical of proposing to those parts. You know, they want you to be able to move on, to be okay, they have good intention, but letting them know, I know you think that suppressing this and trying to move on is the best way forward, but what if that's actually prolonging the ability to move forward? And what if there was one inside of you that could turn toward the grief in a loving way and that that was the best way to move forward? And I know in my system, that was absolutely true. Um, you know, in my experience, you know, they say the only way through, you know, what did they say? <laughs> the only way past grief is through, right? Is, um, and for me, it was just turning toward the grief in a loving, loving way. No matter how many years later, the grief, you know, is equivalent to the love that you have for that person. And so allowing it to be there like a friend, right? And, and connecting to that person or working with whatever parts are in the mix blocking the way right? That had negative experiences with that person. Sometimes the relationship was so complicated that there really is a mix of parts inside with very different reactions to the loss. 
And what's wonderful in IFS is that that's okay. The self can hold space for all of it at the same time. So um, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, there's many other examples in Derek's chapter on grief. Um, if you want to check them out in this book. And if you have any comments or any questions about that passage, please feel free to leave them in the comments below.